Nelson is on this tour of South Africa. He's probably seen all nine provinces by now, uh, speaking about the gospel of decoloniality. Uh, for those of you who've been around for a while, you know that the Center for Indian Studies in Africa, SWAP, and so on, we've been trying to promote this idea of new knowledge for a new generation to create a new time kind of thing. And uh, two years ago, uh, the Center for Indian Studies in Africa, of which I'm the director, my name is Dilip Menon, we had invited Walter Mignolo uh, to come over and he delivered a series of lectures on decoloniality. And he uh, told us that Nelson would be coming. You know, so he announced the coming of Nelson and here indeed he is. And one of the central things that happened with uh, Walter Mignolo being here is that we finally began to think with South America here, you know, system well, I can't say systematically, but one began to think about the intellectual uh, map of South America as well as the genealogy of thinking that goes back to people like Gutierrez and uh, uh, you, know, you can think about uh, Arturo Escobar and uh, Enrique Dussel, a whole uh, generation of stellar luminaries who have tried to think athwart the Euro-American tradition. So here today we have uh, a, a talk that's being organized by the Society of Work and Development Institute headed by Carl uh, and uh, we have Alberto introduce uh, Nelson and his uh, work more systematically. Uh, the Research Collective on Decoloniality, uh, as you all know, uh, has been associated with the names of Walter Mignolo and Arturo Escobar. But uh, it builds upon the work done by Enrique Dussel and Anivale Quijano, as also Maria Lugones, who speaks about the idea of decolonial feminism. So there's a whole range of thinkers uh, and Nelson stands within a tradition with, of which we must be aware. Uh, so very often when we get people coming and doing talks, say we see them as singular figures, but there's a whole uh, network of thinking from which they come, as well as ideas that they've been engaging with for at least a generation. So one of the significant departures that Nelson, well, departures, additions, refinements that Nelson has done to uh, or within this idea of decoloniality is to move away from uh, the idea of coloniality of power to the idea of coloniality of being. And again, he will be speaking much more about this, and again, Alberto will introduce some of this, which is to move away from the idea that we were familiar with from Habermas, for example, of the unfinished project of modernity, the unfinished project of democracy, and so on. What, how Nelson frames the question is rather the unfinished project of decolonization. And uh, we all, uh, to a simple difference would be that we are all decolonized nations here. India was decolonized in 1947. A large number, a swathe of African countries were decolonized in the 50s and the 60s. But decoloniality is something to do with the structures of thought, structures of knowledge, which remain unchanged. And that is something that we are actually thinking about here, which is being, uh, and the symptoms of that we see in the kinds of uh, politics that actually asks for things which are easily granted. So for example, the roads must fall movement. The Senate of the University of Cape Town had no problem in taking down the statue. But they have severe problems with decolonizing the university, right? About changing the syllabus, changing the ways in which things are taught, moving away from a Euro-American tradition which has become the standard canon. So here too a politics of naming, you know, you could name every building in this university, the Solomon Maflandu House, you could call it the Lillian Ingoi uh, Law Center, you could go on. But the structures of teaching, the question of language, the question of knowledge, and the question of pedagogy, the triad around which we are now trying to think, and we're very grateful uh, to Nelson for being here. What he's going to speak on, uh, the title for today is Whiteness Must Fall, The Gift of Black Consciousness and the Imperative of Decoloniality in the University. And I'll just call upon Alberto to do a brief introduction. Thank you, Alberto, for bringing Nelson here. Uh, Nelson will be speaking tomorrow at the Center for Indian Studies in Africa at 10 o'clock, which I hope is a, a better time for people who wake up late. He was supposed to start at 9, but I think people would slowly come in and they'll get half his argument, uh, which might be good as well. So, uh, Albert, over to you. Thank, thanks a lot, man. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming here, for joining us today. Uh, well, most of you know the work of, of 
Nelson Maldonado Torres. He's a theorist in modernity slash coloniality and decoloniality. Uh, he's a specialist in the work of Frank Fanon. He's a member of the executive board of the Frank Fanon Foundation in, in France. And from 2008 to 2013, if I'm right, he was the president of the Caribbean Philosophical Association. Uh, he teaches currently at Rutgers University, and for the last few months he's been a uh, visitor researcher here in, in, in South Africa. But that's the kind of formal presentation. I wanted to talk about something else, because he doesn't know, I mean, it's impossible that he remembers what I'm going to say right now. But the first time I, I met uh, Nelson, it was nine years ago, in a, in a conference that took place in my hometown in, in Madrid. Spain. It was a conference that was called the Decolonization of Eurocentric Modernity, a dialogue between Latin America and Europe. And in that conference, uh, Walter Mignola was there, Enrique Dussel, Maria Lugones, uh, Ramon Grosfogel, Nelson himself. Um, for a whole generation of activists in Spain, that conference was a turning point, definitely. Uh, so thank you for it. It happened nine years ago, but it changed, I mean, for many of us, for people like myself that had close ties to, to Latin America, that had grown politically and emotionally with the Zapatista rising in, in Mexico and that were very close to the, the struggles in, in uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, Argentina, Colombia. Uh, through all these connections, through our connections with these struggles, we grew uh, increasingly aware, we became aware of the limitations of our own theoretical tools. I mean, we were more and more aware that it uh, didn't matter how critical or radical our Eurocentric uh, thought was, there were many things that we couldn't understand and, and explain in our terms. So that what we had to do is to learn how to learn with and from the South. So, and, and in, in that idea of learning with and from the South, uh, these uh, conference in 2007 was really a watershed for, 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 many, for many of us. And from that, that point on, uh, many of us took this framework of the epistemologies of the South as our own intellectual and political project. And we tried to think in, in our own particular location, the South of the North, the South of, of Europe, what would it mean to, to be colonized? Well, well, could that be in, in our own particular context? Would, what would it be like to decolonize northern academia in terms of content and in terms of methodologies? Uh, and through this process of asking these questions and trying to answer to them collectively, we came to realize that these conversations are taking place almost everywhere. I mean, there are many people taking these kind of conversations in many different parts of the world. So our, po our point was, uh, I mean, all of these struggles should uh, listen and talk to each other. I mean, we should be uh, learning from each other's struggles at this point. And that is why we wanted to invite Nelson as well, because he is familiar with the debates and the practices that are taking place in Latin America, but also in the United States, and also in Europe, and now in South Africa. So we thought that this could be a very important contribution for the debates, the, the ongoing debates here uh, at BITS. An institution that, as, uh, as an activist from the Feast Mass Fall Movement mentioned last Friday in our SWOP breakfast seminar, she said something like, here we breathe coloniality all the time. So in a context where we are breathing coloniality all the time, what would it mean to have this uh, conversation, keep this conversation going about uh, decolonization? Last November, I was in Colombia in the third Latin American colloquium on coloniality, the coloniality of uh, power, knowledge, and and being. And yeah, it was an amazing opportunity to be with a lot of people from all places, from all countries in the continent, just sharing their experiences. People that are working within the academia and people that are working outside academia. And in Latin America, indigenous movements and indigenous intellectuals uh, use the image of the long night of 500 years 
to talk about the history of colonialism and to talk about coloniality today. You know, the idea of the long night of 500 years. And for them, um, what Grossfogel calls, and this I have to read, because it's impossible to learn this, is what Grossfogel calls the modern colonial capitalist patriarchal western centric Christian centric world system. Uh, for them, Latin America is uh, a civilization of death. I mean, we are a civilization. We, me, as European, a civilization of death that is based simultaneously in ethnocide, in ecocide, and in epistemicide. We destroyed all the people, we destroyed the planet, and we destroyed all the knowledges and other ways of, of producing knowledge. And again, such violence, I think that decolonization is a much needed project. A few weeks ago, Nelson was, was here, and he described uh, decolonization as an ethical, political, theoretical, and poetic intervention. Ethical, political, theoretical, and poetic. And I'm sure that the presentations today, the, now Nelson and then the, the panelists, uh, will bring all these four dimensions uh, together against war, against the civilization of death. And without <coughs> further delay, just thank again Nelson for coming and thank all of you for joining us this morning. Thank you very much, Alberto. Um, thanks also to SWAP for the kind invitation to join you in this space uh, for the second time now at, at BITS. And thank you all for coming this, this morning. And uh, a few things be, be, before I start, let me see in this, in what may seem this like tour of, of South Africa and South African institutions. My original plan in coming here was very much different from anything like that. I've been coming here for the last three years to participate, including this year, to participate in the decoloniality summer school that has been happening in Atunisa, in Pretoria. Right. So when it was time for, and during that process, I was engaged in that process and a number of years before that. I've been engaged in a number of series of struggles in, in, of struggles in my two institutions in the United States, the University of California, Berkeley, and Rutgers University, uh, doing multiple you know, different things, from organizing to directing centers to pedagogies, to working with students. So a number of efforts in the more practical dimensions of the decolonization of knowledge and decolonization of the university. So um, the, the intellectual work in the horizon, I was doing it, but during the last at least eight years, it has not been uh, my uh, focus. The, intellectual, the production has been coming, but not as much as I, as I would like, so I have plenty of notes waiting for me. So I've been waiting for that moment when I finally you know, complete, you, know, you, you go through those struggles, they go through cycles sometimes, so you finish the cycle, and you wait for an opening where you think that you can responsibly sort of step out to something else before you engage. So this was the moment where I was stepping out from these long struggles and coming here to then finally focus on, on my work, finish a book manuscript, go to another one, go for promotion and all of that. And so uh, when I came though, you know, the idea was to do a, a small seminar at UNISA with mainly with people who had participated in the previous summer schools. So it was like 12 to 15 people, the idea we distribute work, and actually I had already said, am I going to distribute part of my work that I'm going to be revising for inclusion in these other projects and so on. Uh, nothing like that happened. <laughs> uh, nothing like that happened in a way because we did not anticipate uh, the level of interest there was, first of all, by having someone working, uh, you know, specialized on the coloniality at UNINSA in the not, you know, during the normal semester, right? because before we were in the, in the recess, and only a number of people would come, but there would be so many others who would be out. So we don't anticipate that there would be so much interest in there uh, already. And then, of course, part of that interest, I think, has to do with the fact that then, by this year, by last year, the coloniality and the questions about the decolonization of the university were not only these intellectual topics that you know, some radical intellectuals were pursuing, it was part of the, you know, it was brought to the public arena uh, in South Africa by the student movements. So the territory was ex very much different than anything that we anticipated. Right? And even my visit here, I started to plan it 
before Autosmos fully emerged last, last March and so on. So, so when I come here, then I still think, because nobody knows what is going to happen this semester, right? Everybody. But of course, not only the, the student Muslims pick up, but also the institutions are still, many of them searching, trying to find out what is this thing that they call decolonization and what do we do about it? Right? And so suddenly you find transformation committees, task teams, multiple groups at UNISA, which is interesting because, interesting because UNISA is, has been right, working on decoloniality even before they were pushed by anyone to do this or any pressure. So you would think that you know, they have even building on that, they can continue radically. But I found very, sort of a little bit funny that the equivalent, the, this, the version of the transformation team, the transformation team task, um, is actually called um, the change management unit. Yeah. Mm. Which is like, the, at least from a certain perspective, the most neoliberal <laughs> concept that you can imagine to sort of respond to anything that has to do with decolonization. Transformation is already a down, right? Transformation is already, you're bringing it in a certain way. But your key, at least transformation, you know, it's not revolution, it's not decolonization. Transformation still, so, but then change, manage. So even you, you have to manage a unit, you, create, you need to manage change. So they accomplish. I do not say that that you know the spirit of, of the thing is different and so on. Just that it's very interesting, illuminating the kind of names and so on. Anyway, that's the setting there. Now, when I came, the amount of interest that there is, um, I think, and, and the amount of interest in me sharing some ideas about this, about that. So I had to decide: Do I say firmly, only 12 to 15 people are going to enter in this room weekly, and we're going to divide? And that's it, and this will be my time, or, or not. Right. So I went through that process, and well, at the end, I decided, you know, one cannot possibly say that consistently. You're talking about decolonization and, you know, contributing to debates and so on, and precisely in the moment where multiple sectors are asking for certain kinds of clarification, or at least other perspectives, you're not going to go hiding. So, um, so I step in, and also what I've done is taking it as an opportunity to then continue refining the ideas that I have had, and then I took it as a laboratory of sorts. This also is a unique form of entering the South African Academy in a very peculiar time, right? entering all these spaces and being able to have the privilege. People are listening to you for an hour, you know what that is, and then you get to see their responses to what you are saying. And so I did my own sort of, I took it as an ethnography of sorts. Now it'd be sort of a philosophical ethnographer or something. You know, coming to the place, I engage, I observe, I take, and I'm learning lots of things. Some of which I'm going to share now at the end point of my, you know, of my, of my stay. With regards to the networks, and I want to say something about the networks because when you mention Latin America, you know, when you mention these networks, sometimes uh, we are so used to think about, in terms of the traditional ideas of space and time that sometimes we see, okay, this is another importation from here, from there, and so on. And I think, and actually something that I have increasingly getting an, gotten got an awareness about it here. You know, space and time, they of course work in multiple different ways. For example, when I lived in, in New York City, uh, one of the times when I lived in, in New York City, um, um, I was living in the most crappy building on the Upper East Side. Right? Um, in the Upper East Side is not, you know, the Met are, is there, uh, the Metropolitan Museum, the park, you can go walking and running the park. I mean, it's usually very expensive, very elite, and so on. Again, I was in a, uh, uh, I was sort of living in an extremely cheap apartment there, where everything, you know, I was glad that I was not the one living in front of my building, looking at my building, because it would be the obvious sight. <laughs> And so, right, bathroom outside, whatever, you know, but you live there, so you leave the, the, the space. And so, actually, the temporality between living in the apartment, you feel like living in a particular time and place. When you go out, it's like another one. When you take the subway, and then you go to Brooklyn or something like that, it's like ages, you know, in New York, depending on where you stop, it's a different time and place. I mean, they could be one kilometer apart, two kilometers apart. But really, that's not how temporality or speciality so even if you're living in the city, two different places could be, I mean, you step up and you are like in two different 
worlds all together. So you see, even though people would say, oh, you're New Yorkers, and well, you know, depending on where you live. And actually, it could be that the temporality, temporal dimensions of one place in New York are closer to a particular sector of the town in Johannesburg, and so on and so forth. So, right, so there are places in New York that even though it's very far away, it could be very connected to here. And so like that, there could be places in Chiapas, Mexico, that the temporality and the lived experience is closer to other places of Africa. So really, the world doesn't really match, right? The space and time don't, don't really match in that way. I think that that realization is what you know, inspired a lot of these, the intellectuals of decolonization in the 20th, 20th century when they began to imagine you know, the notion of the third world. And the third world it was, yes, in part a spatial, it's particular spatial cartographical thing, but then particularly uh, women of color began to conceive of it as you know, the third space. It's another kind of, it's, a, it's another speciality. It doesn't map out concretely. And from that space, there are certain, you know, experience in living in a certain way, and you can think in a, in a particular, relate to other, to other things and think in a particular way. So, yes, there are the differences of your political space and time, but that is not the entire picture of space and time. So even though Latin America could be found very far, parts of it could be very close to certain parts of Africa. Much closer than some parts of Johannesburg will be to each other. So you have to figure this out when you begin to think about you know, decolonial thinking and, and decolonial de thought. Particularly in my case, the networks with which I've been affiliated have, you know, from Latin America, but also from the Caribbean. And the Caribbean itself, is a very heterogeneous unit that you cannot understand. It has all, it has legs everywhere. Africa, Asia, you know, India, China, e everywhere. So when you say, well, what space is, what is the space of the Caribbean? It tends to the entire, you know, to many other parts. In order really to understand the Caribbean, you have to understand the, the world. So it was the Caribbean Africana studies and then Latin American and Latino studies. So already when you ask me, well, what is your special location? You know, I don't know. Can, do I have any in particular? Of course, I have something, but what is difficult to map it in the traditional sense? So I like to put it, so hopefully to avoid that, then, because this something's happened, that then people sort of read it already from the outset as coming from a particular geopolitical space, and then that's it, right? And they, then the, the investment is how do we point out the differences? And it's not that there are not differences, it's that they may have to explain, explain or approach somehow differently than usual. Um, with respect to, to the talk today, um, I wanted, it's, it's titled Whiteness Must Fall, but also it makes reference to the university and to the gift of black consciousness. And so, in my stay here, what I decided, you know, when I began to do this, this, this presentation, and it, uh, as I was saying to Alberto before, I, I'm not sort of trying to simply repeat the same presentation 30 times, but actually, modifying what I have to say in every single space. Um, and so would be the, the, the case uh, today. But the two broad topics that I see myself engage, engaging, or maybe producing uh, more ideas of, about them, are, about, are whiteness on the one hand. Whiteness on the one hand, and whiteness, as I was saying before, partly, partly on the new experience as uh, sometimes an honorary white in this country, which for me, being an Afro-Latino, is in the US I would never be considered as white. But then suddenly you come to another space where actually sometimes in some spaces whites treat you as white or at least not black enough not to be, you know, to be, to have an intimacy with them. And then that leads you to discover certain things about, about whiteness that otherwise, you know, you can study, but now you actually see them, experience them in another more raw level. So I began to think about that. And then when I found resonances of that same raw, a strong racism, I saw it, I began to felt it, to find it, to identify it in the more liberal halls of academia, then I said, okay, let me pursue this. So I began to create a typology of, of white consciousness, as it were, out of that experience. And so that's something that I'm doing with that, right? And probably would be here, but it, it, it would be different. But that's the whiteness part. The other part is the university, right? And it has to do with the students, uh, mobilizations because I'm coming for the last 10 years and this is also re relates to the, to, the, to the question of a space and the space from where you think and partly the space from where, from where I think very much, I mean very little, institutionally uh, in Berkeley, for example, 
it was a space that was created out of uh, what has been the longest student strike in the history of the continental US, which happened in, in California, uh, in the San Francisco State University and the University of California, Berkeley, in what was called then the Third World Strike. And so they, op they wanted to create the Third World College. And you, you see them, they, they define, saying they were not talking about American college or this or that, you know, with the Latin or they were talking, they were at book, they were trying to open this space, this conceptual space, which was the so-called third world. And so anyway, I taught there for seven years. So a lot of my thinking, a lot of had to do with the impact that the student movements can have in the academy as clearly contributors to the point of creating new fields of knowledge in the university that otherwise will very likely not have been opened. And so also the kind of thinking that that space allows, the kind of freedom, the kind of questions that it, it, that it poses to you. So then I came to Rutgers, and in Rutgers University, I then became the chair of the department of, now it's called Latino and Caribbean Studies, but it was a department emerging in the early 70s as a program in Puerto Rican Studies that came also out of a student mobilization and a strike at Rutgers University. So for the last you know, decade of my career, more than a decade of my career, I have been actually teaching in these spaces. So in a way, when I then you know, come and, and see other movements fighting for the colonization of the university, I'm coming as someone who has benefited uh, from uh, the space opened by those movements and also for the time from the reflections that have been allowed in those spaces. And so the student mobilization and the theorization of a student mobilization has been key. And so that led me to two presentations thus those, those far around that topic, and this will be the third. So the first one actually, um, I made it here before, when I presented a sort of a view of the university, of the student movements and student mobilization in the last 50 years or so, in the context of the long durée of the Western University. So going back to the emergence of the Western University and the emergence of the humanities from the 12th to the 15th century of the Common Era. Then moving to the Enlightenment and identifying the revolution of the Renaissance, European Renaissance, the revolution of the European Enlightenment, and seeing now really a student activity as the formation of a third major revolution and new conditions and so on. I took an hour to explain that uh, before and so on, so I, I will not repeat that now. So that's not the topic for today anyway. But just to let you know, I have done that sort of very broad, very broad theoretical and historical scope. Now, the other, the other presentation that I just focused on the university was very, very different. And on the other side of it, on the other end of it, was very particular. And this was in a park. I think the students call it Asania, Asania 2 is the, the, the park at, at, uh, in Cape Town, where students um, um, across most fall was meeting um, because some of the students have been suspended, so uh, I was going to talk with them, so we met outside of the university in this park. And so I shared some ideas with the student movement, and they were, though, about very, you know, I was asking, like, what, what they would like, you know, what they would like to talk about and so on. And the message that they got was that, well, they were interested in, you know, I knew I was from Puerto Rico, so some people were interested in the Puerto Rican student strike of 2010-2011, which actually is now the longest student strike. There has been the longest student strike in the history of the U.S. or U.S. territories. So you see the two, the two longest student strikes in the U.S. have been by people of color or colonial subjects. And for my understanding, have been about the colonization of the university. So that's why I don't think that this is what is happening here. As I've noted before, it have was um, in a way predictable. Whenever you have desegregation in a highly segregated setting, where you have desegregation of bodies and the different bodies are allowed to enter that space, those bodies will come with minds. Right. And so, not to, thank you, not, it, it won't go too much time since those minds will begin to ask, not only for the physical desegregation, for epistemological desegregation and decolonization. And that is probably what that revolution is about. So anyway, that, that presentation was very specific about the third world strike in California, the student strike, and about the, the strike uh, in Puerto Rico, 
and about the challenges, the successes, the follow-up, what you can, and then we went into a more detailed, very concrete discussion about where you can transit from, you know, the moment of a strike to then the moment of so-called transformation of um, change management. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the two talks that I give on the university have been one extremely broad <laughs> from the 12th century up to now, the other one very focused on particular strikes and what, what to do concretely. Uh, so this one is in between. This one is sort of in between. And it's in between though, and I, 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 already, I said from the outset that, that it is tentative because then it is in between means that I'm talking more about the South African university and the contemporary um, student uh, struggles. And I think in the whiteness must fall to what is happening up in right now. Now, of course, this is based on my limited exposure so far. Five years in conversation with South African academics, the last three years coming here, and now in the last part of my the three months. So I, I, in a way, you know, I, I was telling Alberto, when I came here the first time, it was uh, everything is new. This is, you know, I, want, I was observing everything. You know. Second time, I observed again, and I began to see a couple of patterns, but I was still not sure. When I came the third time, then, oh, that's a pattern of right, that you are able to identify. And when I was able to identify it and also be in conversation with my colleagues, then I, I dare for the first time to speak about it or to dare to initiate some theorization about it. So this is, I, this is the result of that. But still, admittedly, very tentative, right? Very tentative and put it there for conversation. And so this, this one, this one is deeply connected with something that I've written about in um, this book I published in 2008, Against War. And the first chapter and the second chapter have to do, you know, focus on Emmanuel Levinas. But the first chapter has to do with, uh, focuses on Emmanuel Levinas's, uh, and a short essay that he published, I think it was 1933, on reflections about the philosophy of Hitlerism, the philosophy of Hitlerism. Hitler was about to, Hitlerism was about to unfold. And Levinas was a Jew, so you're a Jewish intellectual, then looking at this formation that he started to see. And he's talking about that, you know, for a number of Jews, in a way, you know, European, particularly French liberalism, seemed to be a salvation for them to go, because he's focused on these universal principles and so on. And then gradually they began to see that, that you know, it was not as ideal as they thought. And when they saw fascism coming, they said, okay, let's see this, you know, because to what extent fascism is really something, something completely different that now is imposed on Europe, at least in parts of Europe, or to, the, or to what extent is there a linkage? Particularly when many of the new fascists were liberals before. So how can you transition from one thing to the other like that, you know, ideologically? So let's explore the linkages between liberalism and fascism. And so what I do there is I analyze it and also I link it to the question of then uh, colonialism. Basically the idea is that liberalism and fascism may be more connected to each other than we may think. And I think also that the same goes with the practice and politics of colonialism. And you cannot understand the three, you know, the three needs to be understood in connection. Liberalism, fascism, coloniality. And then the question of decolonization is a question also of desfascization of society and reality, but also it might be that the deliberalization of reality. So what does that mean when you are thinking that liberalism sort of is the instrument that takes you beyond? Right? Is that a ruse that we're playing between fascism and liberalism? The other reason why they seem to come, you know, they seem to, touch, to, take, to take sides and one harbors the other, right? One harbors the other inside, and after one phase, the other enters, and then the one produces the other. Uh, I mean, that seemed to have been a lesson of the last 100 years, if not 200 years. So, what does that mean to advocate for liberalism 
in a context, this is my question, in a context deeply marked by fascism, segregation.